we are really interested in things that are unusual in the standard model. Uh, what we are trying to do, is to act, which is different with respect to other experiments, is that we are trying to produce dark matter in our laboratory. We, as experimentalists, we have to be particularly cunning, let's say, and uh, yeah. <laughs> innovative in our, in our search techniques to try and make sense of, of dark matter in the lab. We need to give this, uh, this storyline to Marvel. Maybe we're going to have Spider-Man uh, going to the, the dark uh, the dark universe. Dark matter is also not such a good name. Yeah. Maybe some form of <laughs> we invisible in matter. The we're the ones in the dark. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Early Morning Coffee at CERN. My name is Stephen Goldfarb. I am Ana Paula De Cosa. And I'm Batis Ravino. We have a great show for you today. We're going to be talking about what seems to be your favorite topic, dark matter. And of course, we're doing it because October 31st is Dark Matter Day. I knew you knew that. Of course you knew that. So we have with us Ana Paula Da Cosa, an assistant professor at ETH Zurich, ETH the Technical Institute in, in Zurich, and uh, Baptiste Ravina, a research fellow now recently at CERN. Congratulations. It's not easy to get one of those um, fellowships. Um, and I want you guys to know that we held a poll after our last podcast. And in that poll, we asked people, what topic do you want to hear about the most? And they thought about you guys. They said, we want to know about dark matter. We've heard about dark matter, but we don't know what it is. How do you go about looking for it, especially if it's something that you can't see? How do you look for it? So um, there's a lot of interest in the stuff that you're doing. So why don't we start with Ana Paula. Um, Maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself, what got you interested in looking for something that, that you can't see here at CERN. Uh, okay, so um, I was uh, uh, at my first postdoc, so right after uh, I finished my PhD and was already here at CERN and I had the possibility to work with uh, tremendous colleagues. Uh, and I started to uh, work on, on the search for a particular kind of dark matter that we call WIMP, weak interactive massive particle. Um, and this search was uh, just amazing, I mean, for me, because, I mean, dark matter has been, I mean, for, as for many of you, uh, has been always uh, quite a mystery. Uh, and this is especially something that we know that is there. Uh, we have evidence for it coming from several sources, right? But still, I mean, we cannot explain it. So we don't know what is the nature of dark matter. Uh, and after decades of looking for it, uh, I mean, this is still eluding, right? Mm -hmm. So this is what uh, was what uh, capturing my, my, my attention. And then I started to think about completely different hypotheses about dark matter and just really uh, uh, living... Um, getting free my imagination on mm -hmm. possible models and possible additional ways and possible tools, uh -huh. new tools, uh, to, to catch dark matter. And uh -huh. this is how I... And you're doing these now on CMS. And I'm doing this now with the CMS experiment. Yes, uh -huh. exactly. Okay. Baptiste, tell us, tell us about yourself. How, yeah. How, so, what I mean, you first, first of all, I completely agree with what Anapala said. I mean, it's really, dark matter is really something that captures your imagination, especially as a young student where you're confronted to all of these big ideas. And then it's, uh, it's a vector of more creativity later down uh, in your work. And for me, I started when I was a student working on uh, some cosmological models, trying to explain maybe what dark matter uh, could be, mm -hmm. one of infinitely many models. And I thought, okay, this is very interesting, but now I would like to do something towards actually finding it. Uh -huh. And that's what got me uh, into experimental particle physics uh -huh. uh, on the ATLAS experiment, and I started doing my PhD there. And then one idea led to the, to the other, and I just took a very different path from what I would have imagined originally, but always driven by you know, this goal of finding, finding out what dark matter is. What, what is this stuff? I mean, it has a, it has a long history, right? Uh, dark matter goes way back. I, I, I looked into this recently, because I didn't, I didn't realize it went back so far, 1880s or something. Uh, uh, Lord Kelvin was already talking about there must be other stars out there which are dark, which you which you can't see, and I think that it all came about from gravitational measurements, right? It's, it seems something out there in space uh, has mass, and it's attracting things, or maybe it's a gravitational effect. We we don't really know, right? But we can see this. What what are the different ways that you can see this? Well, there are actually diff really different ways that you can see it. Uh, 
Uh, some of them are, for instance, looking at the way in which um, stars move in, uh, in galaxies, right? As, uh, especially in, uh, in spiral galaxies. What they were expecting for the, the movement of the, of the star uh, was actually very different with respect to what, uh, what they measured. Uh, and this was, uh, and this is something that even today we can explain only if you assume that there is another kind of, of matter, quite massive matter, that permeates this, uh, these galaxies. Uh, and this is one of the, uh, one of the evidence. Uh, we also have uh, other evidence, uh, for instance, from the, uh, the study of uh, what is called the cosmic microwave background, which is the, the, the radiation that comes directly from, from the past to us, mm -hmm. like from after a few seconds after the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. And we can actually study this today. Uh, and this is uh, showing us how there are different than how the, uh, there was there were already different densities in the, in the universe uh, already at the time, and these differences can only be explained uh, if we uh, have dark matter playing a role. So if there's, if there's stuff out there that we can't see that we right? cannot the, see that the visible light does not explain what we're seeing in these patterns that came from the cosmic microwave background, which is which is a long time ago uh, before even I was a student. Uh, <laughs> Something like 13.8 billion years minus uh, 100,000 or something like that. <laughs> something like that. Uh, when when electrons started spinning around protons, and they gave us this background radiation, and, and you can you can map that. So there's maps of dark matter now, right? Yeah. I, on, on the cosmic microwave background, it's very interesting because that brings together general relativity, so the study of the universe as a, as the infinitely large object that it is, mm -hmm. uh, together with particle physics, because you have to know what kind of particles were there in the early universe and how they interacted or did not interact together. And that helps you map out yeah, the, the history of the universe. Mm -hmm. Whereas the, uh, the first example that Anapara gave, just looking at galaxies, that's extremely simple. And that's why you could already do it in the, in the late 1900s. Um, sorry, in the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. uh, because you're just looking at galaxies and you're doing two types of measurements. One, you're measuring how fast things are moving, and the second, you're measuring how bright things are. Because mm -hmm. you can imagine that in a galaxy where you have a bunch of stars, much, uh, most of the mass is actually in the stars. So mm -hmm. if you just count the visible bright stuff to a very good approximation, you get the mass of the galaxy. Mm -hmm. And these two techniques give you very different answers, right? Uh -huh. And that's why we think that the, uh, the, if there's a mass that's there that we're not actually seeing, it's because it's not bright, because it's not interacting like uh, normal matter would. Like normal matter, so it's only matter. It's only interacting through gravity, uh, and I think I think it was first there was uh, the the dark matter. I, it bothers me the name dark matter. I'm sorry, because <laughs> it's really invisible, right? Uh, I think that came from way way back. Uh, Fritz Zwicky was a Swiss physicist, and uh, uh, he came out with with calling it dark matter. It's okay. We forgive him, uh, but he was really one of the first to, to, to give that name and to have seen clusters of galaxies, right? And then later on uh, in the 20th century, Vera Rubin did these, this final measurement of the spinning of stars and galaxies, and she gave a number to it. So it's not a small amount of matter, but, but how much of the matter in the universe is, is Well, matter? this is about 25% of the energy of the entire uh, universe energy content, but if you want to compare it with the ordinary matter, the matter mm -hmm. that we know, the mm -hmm. matter that composed uh, our stars, our galaxies, even uh, we as humans, uh, it's about uh, five times, which means five that times. out yeah. there, so about, I mean, the old matter that is in the universe, we just not 5%. But then uh, there uh -huh. is another mass, another uh, kind of matter, which is at least uh, five times more abundant with respect to what we know, which uh -huh. is really huge. Uh -huh. And we don't know anything about its nature. Yeah. Uh, the point is that usually the way in which you uh, perform an identity kit of particles mm -hmm. is understanding, uh, trying to understand, measuring what are the effects of its interaction with other particles, right? Mm -hmm. So how this, how this particle in, interact, mm -hmm. and then now we can perform an identity kit. But the problem is that uh, apparently uh, dark matter does not interact in other way as, uh, as not gravity. So this is, for the moment, all the informations that we have really come from the, uh, the gravitational interaction of okay. dark matter, which is still quite limited. But we are still, I mean, we still have hope that there, is, there are other ways of interaction that we can study. 
Because gravity is rather hard. Right? Gravity, compared to, say, electromagnetism, is, is something like, what, a million, 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 million times weaker, right? So, yeah. so building an experiment to, to measure that effect, you need galaxies, you need clusters of galaxies like, like they did, um, it, you know, measuring it cosmologically. So, so we're here uh, at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, where we have two largest, most beautiful experiments, ATLAS and CMS. How on earth can you expect to actually see dark matter in those experiments? Okay, so I would say that our plan is very ambitious. Mm -hmm. uh, what we are trying to do, is to act, which is different with respect to other experiments, is that we are trying to produce dark matter in our laboratory. Yeah. Uh, and this is amazing because if we manage to produce dark matter in our laboratory, this means that we can also study it. I mean, we can keep studying it for years and years to come mm -hmm. and really try to understand uh, all the properties of these particles. Mm -hmm. If it's just one particle, if there are more particles, um, we can study all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are uh, several ways in which we can do it. Uh, and this depends also, of course, on the nature of dark matter. So if dark matter uh, is just uh, composed of one particle that interacts very weakly, or if it's composed by several particles, and then, I mean, depending on which kind of dark matter we are looking for, mm -hmm. uh, we adapt our search okay. Okay. and define new tools. Uh -huh. And I think it's very important to point out that we didn't build the LHC or any of the experiments to actually look for things that are not there, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, we actually need something to measure in our detectors, mm -hmm. things to interact with. Um, so definitely we, as experimentalists, we have to be particularly cunning, let's say, and uh, uh -huh. <laughs> innovative in our, in our search techniques to try and make sense of, of dark matter in the lab. Mm -hmm. We have to be rather open-minded. Open so, so my understanding is, is, you know, if it's not going to interact, right, right, we don't see it interacting, we don't, we don't have light coming from it, so there's no electromagnetic uh, radiation or anything coming from it. We don't necessarily see that there's no strong interaction or you say weak, weakly interacting massive particles, maybe there's a weak interaction, we don't, we don't know, but then that might affect things a different way. Uh, so if we're not going to see it in the detector, is there a way to still know that it's there? Well, yes. We are actually looking for something that we don't see. Okay. Uh, which might seem a bit uh, weird. But in the end, what we do is that uh, we expect our matter to behave in a very similar way to neutrinos, which means it does not interact with our detectors, right? Uh -huh. uh, if we manage to produce dark matter at the uh, in proton proton collisions at the Large Hadron Collider, what would happen is that it would simply escape um, uh, our detectors. But the point is that uh, we know what is the energy of the and the momentum of the incoming particles, the incoming protons, right? Okay. Uh, and we know uh, that uh, energy and momentum are conserved, right? Mm -hmm. So this is what we use in order to infer. Uh, the presence of dark matter. So if we have an imbalance in the end, in the energy that uh -huh. we measure, uh -huh. this means that there is something which is escaping uh, our reconstruction, that is escaping our detectors. I see. And, and then, I mean, we infer the production of dark matter particles. Mm -hmm. So in a way, the, uh, the first step is to become really, really good at measuring what can actually be seen, because you have to keep very good track of all of the energy that you actually produce in the form of visible particles. Mm -hmm. So you need to be extremely precise there. And then you can say, okay, if something's missing, then perhaps it's not a fault of the detector or one uh -huh. of the neutrinos, because as Anapala mentioned, we do have neutrinos in the standard model, uh -huh. particles that we know of, uh -huh. and that we also know can't be dark matter particles. This has been ruled out okay. uh, quite some time ago. Oh, okay. Um, so it's not neutrinos. So it's not neutrinos, because dark matter also has a role on the cosmological scale uh, to help galaxies form. So you need to clump a lot of dark matter to help attract the normal matter and to form galaxies. This okay. is our current understanding. And the problem is that if you have neutrinos as your dark matter particle, they're extremely light. They're going extremely fast, especially in the early universe, and they're not going to want to clump together. They're just, um, they're just whizzing away. Zoom, yeah. Zooming around. Yeah. So that's, that's what we call uh, warm dark matter, just because it's very hot and energetic. Uh, it's just, it doesn't fit. The, mm -hmm. the observations that we have now of a universe that settled down with a lot uh, of galaxies and large galaxies. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a neutrino is this very, very light particle 
that only interacts through through uh, the weak nuclear interaction. And it's called weak for a reason. It's very, very weak relative to electromagnetism. And so in our detectors, we produce neutrinos that happens when we have the collisions. We're colliding protons. The constituents of the protons, the quarks or gluons, interact with each other. Stuff comes out. Lots of different tracks come out. And we build our detectors so that we can measure all these different types of tracks and all the different energy that comes out. Neutrinos slip out. Uh, we just don't catch them. We do have some dedicated detectors, which if there's a, a gazillion neutrinos, we'll catch a few of them. So that's how we know they exist. And we've measured them, and they've done this in detectors all over the South Pole and in Japan, many places, um, and even here at CERN, at the ends of our detectors, right? Uh, both both for ATLAS and, and CMS. Um, but they will slip through. We won't see it, but we'll see because we've surrounded the collision point entirely, uh, and we have a hermetic seal, beautiful detectors that completely seal. Yeah, we hope. <laughs> and uh, that, that stuff came out because when you have conservation momentum, if you have a collision, two protons, then in the plane that's perpendicular to the beam, it should add up to zero, right? We learned this in, in school. You add up the vectors, it comes out to zero. Okay, so uh, stuff is missing. Now, how do we differentiate between the stuff that's missing, that's neutrinos that we expect, and if it were dark matter. Uh, is there a way to differentiate? Well, uh, the answer to this question is, it depends. Okay. It depends <laughs> on which kind of dark matter you're looking for. Okay. Uh, there are different kinds. Mm -hmm. uh, so as I was saying, for instance, uh, if you expect dark matter to be similar to neutrino, but much heavier, right? Mm -hmm. Um, then, I mean, uh, what you expect is to see a very huge imbalance in the energy that you reconstruct in your detector. So mm -hmm. there is something that it doesn't sum up to zero in mm -hmm. the uh, in the moment that you reconstruct uh, and the energy that you reconstruct. But uh, and then uh, this would be not sufficient, right? Because the problem is that to define uh, an imbalance, uh, you need to have visible object, right, that you reconstruct. Okay. Uh, which means that you're looking for a kind of dark matter that is produced in the lawn, right? Uh, usually you, you expect two dark matter particles that are produced uh, together with some other visible objects. Some, uh, uh, for instance, it can be some quarks, right? Uh, or it can be some leptons. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is one way of doing it. Uh, and this is the most simple one. But then the point is that in principle, dark matter can be almost anything. So you can imagine very complex models in which you have entire new uh, sectors of particles, uh, an entire new family of dark matter particles, right? So not just one, but several of them. Okay. Uh, and the way in which they, manif they would manifest in our detectors is uh, for very weird signature. Really weird. Oh, yeah. What, what, define that, weird. What is a weird? What well, it's, it's something which is very different with respect to what we've uh, built the detector for. Uh -huh. uh, so it's very different, for instance, for an electron, uh, from an electron or from a photon, uh -huh. uh, or even just a simple quark, which actually we don't really see in a so easy way in our detector because we uh -huh. cannot see uh, a simple I mean, a quark they don't stand alone. Quarks. They, they no, don't no, they don't quarks. like to stay, to stay alone. They just uh, get uh, with each other. And uh, essentially what you have is that you start from one quark, which essentially... Um, keeps other work together, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then the result uh, in the detector is a spray of particles. Mm -hmm. So you don't see one particle, but you see a spray that we call mm -hmm. jet, jet of particle, because mm -hmm. it really looks like a jet. Okay. Um, and you can have very weird ones that are very different from the respect. Jet. Yes, you can have, for instance, jet of particles, which are not all visible. So you can have visible ones inside. Uh, they can be a bit larger with respect to what you expect, or they can be narrower, they can have a lot of uh, constituents, they can have just few ones. But this really depends on the on the actual nature of dark matter. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's similar like uh, seeing seeing galaxies and seeing that they're they're not quite moving right, they're, they're different, there's stuff inside there that you don't see. So we'd have a jet, which which has a certain amount of energy, but but it's that's what you're seeing is less than actually what's being produced. Right, because yes, right? exactly. there's, there's that, that sort of invisible stuff that's inside there. So, in a way, what uh, Anapala is describing is that we're really interested in things that are unusual in the standard model. Yeah, uh, because dark matter is really a concept. It's just it's not a theory of itself. Theories 
predict perhaps a dark matter candidate, but uh -huh. there are as many theories as there are theorists, uh -huh. probably even more. <laughs> uh, so we can't possibly just test each of them one after the other. So we have to come up with the interesting bits uh -huh. and perhaps looking for weird types of jets of signatures in our detectors is one way to do it. Um, and another way to do it, I think, that I'm also very interested in, is to really leverage all of the information we get from our detector. So instead of just looking at specific bits, we look at the entire collision as we've recorded it mm -hmm. in all of its gory details, mm -hmm. and we pass that through um, algorithms that will tell, okay, this is an event that we think is pretty much standard model-like, and mm -hmm. here's another one, and here's mm -hmm. another one, and here's actually a billion standard model events. Mm -hmm. Learn what you can from that, and then we'll show you some real data. And okay. within this data, we hope that every billions, trillions, collision, whatever, there might be something that's anomalous enough, different enough from the rest the of what we've seen so far, that it might point us towards, hey, maybe this is something new. Maybe it's also a mistake of the detector. Maybe it's a yeah, that's, temporary that's a, fault, something. Yeah. Um, or maybe it's some phenomenon that is actually standard model-like, but uh -huh. that we hadn't really anticipated. Okay. In all of these cases are interesting to us anyway, as sure. experimentalists. Sure. Yeah, that's the tricky part is your tech detector has to be working perfectly, right? If, if a little part of your detector is off, uh, then something looks like it slipped out, but it was just that it, it didn't get detected. But we have many, many tests, I think, on both Atlas and CMS to make sure that our data are good. Uh, we, uh, we even have, I, I, I'm sure it's the same for CMS and Atlas, we have, we have these, what, these good run lists that say that for this particular thing, for like a search for dark matter, everything was on. Everything was working well, and so take a look and see if you see anomalies in this. So uh, I, I think that's, you know, it, so it's, it's interesting, the difference between what we're doing here on the LHC is, as you said, we're trying to produce it. The LHC, we're hoping the LHC will produce it inside of our detectors. And I suppose there's a good chance of that because what we, what we have found 12 years ago now <laughs> was a Higgs boson. And it must mean there's some chance if, if dark matter is an elementary particle, right? Because an elementary particle with mass must interact with the Higgs boson, right? Must it? <laughs> yeah, but that's, a, that's a very good question because, yeah, as you described, we know that the, the Higgs is responsible for giving mass to the particles that we know of. What about mm -hmm. particles that we don't know about? Some people would posit that, indeed, the Higgs must couple to these dark matter particles. Mm -hmm. And that's one way we can look for it uh, at the LHC. And indeed, that's what we did on both Atlas and CMS, is look for events that pretty much should have a Higgs in them, but mm -hmm. then the Higgs doesn't decay to anything. Or perhaps it decays to invisible ah, particles. Invisible and we, Higgs. In, ah, invisible okay. decays of the Higgs. Uh -huh. And that didn't turn uh, any positive results for dark matter. So, okay, possibly it's something else. Do we have to do away with the Higgs to explain the mass of dark matter? Well, not necessarily. We could just have more Higgses. There could be one Higgs that we discovered that mm -hmm. couples to the standard model particles. Mm -hmm. And that's why we discovered it, because we looked at standard model particles. Okay. There could be partners of the Higgs that couple either to standard model particles and dark matter particles or just to dark matter particles. So dark, dark, uh, dark Higgs. Yeah, a dark, a dark sector, a Higgs, uh, an extended Higgs sector. And that's why we're saying that dark matter is not a theory of its own. It's just a concept. Uh -huh. Then you can invent you know, as complicated a theory as you want uh, to explain whatever other problems as well. Because if you start uh, introducing new Higgses and perhaps you solve other problems than just dark matter. Uh -huh. Imagine that uh, you actually have an entire world, a kind of parallel world, right? Uh -huh. Done just with dark particles. Okay. okay. That can be that can uh, compose your dark matter in the end, right? You can have so we have electrons, muons, right? That we know and we see, but mm -hmm. you could have uh, some dark leptons, right? You can have some dark quarks. So uh, you could have really an entire new family of particles that is uh, living uh, with its own rules, right? Which means with its own interactions. So while in the the uh, the world that we know, when there is the, the gravitation, there is the uh, there is the strong interaction, there is what we call the weak interaction, which is the responsible for radioactivity and so on, or the strong interaction that keeps the quarks together, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in, in in the nuclei of, of the atoms, we could have something similar also in this parallel world, right? Mm -hmm. Just that uh, these rules, this interaction would act would uh, um, only in the, would play a role only with the among the dark particles. 
But then we still need something right uh, to have the two words communicating. Uh-huh, because and this is a big yeah. question mark. Yeah. And this is what uh, uh, what it was mentioned, what it was mentioning uh, that, for instance, an hypothesis could be having the X right. That, uh-huh. uh, that really takes you from the, one to the other. Yes, one? exactly. This could be one of the hypotheses, or uh-huh. uh, you could have another particle, like uh, one particle similar to the Z boson. Uh-huh. And then you can even think about having a dark X in this new dark sector that would explain why this particle at, at mass. Mm-hmm. So there is, uh, and I think, I mean, you can go ahead with your imagination. And yeah, I was going to say, we need, we need to give this, uh, this storyline to Marvel, uh, or, yes. or maybe, maybe we're going to have Spider-Man uh, going to the, the, dark, uh, the dark universe. Um, it is great. What a, what a great field we have that we can use our imagination like this and think about dark universes uh, out there. Um, so uh, before we end up, I, I, I did want to um, ask you a couple questions about the future. What are we going to do in the future? So, so we have a lot of data now. We're in run three of the LHC, and we're going to get a couple more years of data uh, and run three, and then, then we're going to shut down for a while, and we're going to go to something called high-luminosity LHC. So it's five years from now, we hope, something like that. Uh, and we're going to have a lot more uh, collisions per second. Is that going to help, do you think, in these, in these searches? I'm very excited by that, yes, because uh, I'm going at it with the, the point of view of data-driven science. So the mm-hmm. more data I have, definitely the more science I hope to do. Mm-hmm. And it's worth reminding ourselves yeah, that we haven't even collected 10% of the data that we hope to have by the end of the high luminosity LHE. Um, so definitely, yeah, there will be more room for very rare events, very anomalous-like signatures. And also, if you just go about it looking for rare things and anomalous things. Uh, we did uh, a metadata study to see actually how much of the the ground are we covering with our existing measurements. And it's only also about 10, 15% wow. of what is possible. <laughs> it doesn't mean that we're, you know, that we're lazy. It's just really, really hard to cover it's, more. It's a lot of work. So what if, what if, I know it won't happen, but what if we don't find a conclusive answer in high luminosity LHC? What's our next step? You want to dream? Well, yes, <laughs> yes. Why not? I mean, this is actually what is uh, driving right now science, right? Uh-huh. So we're dreaming of different things, and I think that right now this is uh, a unique moment because it's true that we haven't found new physics yet. Mm-hmm. But now, I mean, we are realizing that actually we just looked in one direction, forgetting all the others, and this is mm-hmm. what we are doing right now. This is why the round three, which is the, the, the exact moment in which now, I mean, the the, the machine is operating is so exceptional, and why the eye lumen is, uh, is going to be exceptional. Now we are really thinking about beyond what we have uh, imagined up so far, mm-hmm. uh, and, uh, and the technology is coming with us, which means, or I mean, we are going with, with, with technology, mm-hmm. which means that uh, we are exploiting uh, new tools that we haven't uh, before, like, for instance, machine learning, right? We are mm-hmm. using artificial intelligence in a very, really massive way. And we are pushing even the, um, the application of these techniques mm-hmm. at the frontier because, I mean, the Large Hadron Collider allows to uh, really handle a lot of data and quite complex uh, data problems. Mm-hmm. And then uh, for the next future... And still, I think that this is going to uh, really be exciting for the next years. But then, I mean, behind that, behind the Illumi, we are thinking about uh, building an even larger collider, which we call the Future Collider, where we plan to collide electrons. Uh-huh. And this is going to be amazing because it's uh, very different with respect to what we are doing right now at the Large Hadron Collider, where we are colliding protons. Mm-hmm. And the reason for that is that we will have collisions which are very clean. This okay. means that we won't have, uh, uh, we will have uh, very um, uh, good resolution, very um, uh, low uncertainty mm-hmm. on, the, on the way in which we reconstruct invisible particles, for instance. So that matter will be easier to, to, to be looked for mm-hmm. with these machines. Uh, we will understand much more about what we already know. Because the point is that, uh, yes, I mean, we think that everything works well, but maybe if you go and you look uh, with higher precision, then you might realize that this is not actually the case. And this could be another indication of new physics. Mm -hmm. So there is, I think, I mean, we have plenty in front of us. We have plenty in front of us. Now, I understand that we're we're not, we should be fair, we're not the only game in town. 
Uh, there are others who are looking for dark matter in different ways, right? In different places from deep down in gold mines to up in space. Uh, in fact, uh, someone I used to work for when I first came over here a long, long time ago, Professor Sam Ting has a wonderful experiment that's up there on the International Space Station called AMS. Uh, and there's a lot of other ways that people are looking for dark matter, but are, they aren't going to produce it though, right? They're, they're trying to detect it. Yeah, that, that's the big difference is that those experiments rely on there being dark matter in the universe streaming through the galaxy and hopefully once in a while, you know, visiting our detectors on Earth or as you said, uh, up in space and perhaps knocking uh, an atom a little bit off, creating a signal that otherwise wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. so, um, so definitely that's the big advantage of our experiment here at CERN, mm -hmm. is that if and when we actually find it, we can then tune our machines to make more of it, to study it, and to study its interactions with all of the other particles. Okay, okay. So somewhat, it's pretty complementary then, I guess. All of these approaches are, are complementary. I, I think because we're still very much in the dark about dark matter, that's why dark matter is also not such a good name. Yeah. Be some form of <laughs> we invisible in matter. We're the ones in the dark, Yeah. right? Uh, we... We definitely need all of the uh, the tools uh, that are at disposal to actually look for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, I was just imagining if, if if I went to the bank and and and, and I, I asked the banker, I, I'd like to get my money, and he says, "Well, uh, I only know where you know about mm, ten to twenty percent of it is, <laughs> missing the other eighty to ninety percent." Uh, then uh, I wouldn't be too happy. And so we owe it to the public. We're sorry. We're going to look for it and we're going to find it. And in fact, we we have seen it. It's actually not. If you think about it, we haven't need to discover it. What we need to do is to identify what it is, because we, we know it's out there. We've seen what's out there. We're dealing here with uh, quantum physics, and quantum physics is really weird. Yeah. I think uh, we, like, yeah. that. quantum <laughs> physics is weird. And even if we don't see the particle at the, the LHC or at the high luminosity LHC or some other collider, just because it's a particle that has some quantum properties, it must have a field associated with it. Yeah. Much like the Higgs boson mm -hmm. is... Um, a particle that's extracted from a Higgs field that permeates the universe, or mm -hmm. the electron is associated to an electric um, an electron field. Mm -hmm. um, so just because this dark field, whatever it is, we postulate that it's there, it should be wobbling around with the other fields that we're exciting at the LHC. Exactly. Uh, so even though we can't perhaps put our finger on it or even have the, the right amount of energy to produce, to extract a particle of dark matter from that field, uh -huh. it will modify the interactions of everything else around it. Ah, good point. Good and so point. we could still see hints of it. So much like the Higgs field was giving mass to particles long before we discovered the Higgs boson. So there we go, quantum field theory, lesson number 17. Uh, <laughs> for every particle, there is a field. Excellent. Um, well, I want to thank you guys very much for coming here. Tell us, enlightening us about dark matter on Dark Matter Day. So, uh, Anapola de Cosa is assistant professor at ETH Zurich, and Baptiste Ravina is a CERN research fellow. Thank you very much for coming here. Thank you. Uh, Thank this you. has been an absolute pleasure. This has been Early Morning Coffee at CERN, a podcast by the scientists at CERN about the science of CERN. You can find all of our episodes, well, for now, both of them, uh, on the CERN YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcasts. And I mean anywhere, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, CastBox, Deezer, things that I've never even heard of. Be sure to go there. Be sure to like us, love us, whatever. Follow us. Um, give us a review. We'd like to hear from you. Our editor and producer sitting back there behind the table is Chetna Krishna. Joni Pham also back there is our social correspondent. Our executive producer is Jacques Fichet. Ron, the third person sitting back there. Hi, Ron. Uh, uh, Ron Zuckerbuck is our technical lead. Our studio manager is Max Bryce. Sound design by Piotr Traxik. Our original theme comes from the Kanetz Blues Band, and I promised him I would mention him. The piano bit is done by Voigt. Play it, Neniki Krajewski. Uh, many thanks to... Paula Catapano, Matthew Chalmers, and Arno Marcellier for all of their advice um, and their strategic planning. And a big thanks to the entire uh, education, communication, and outreach team here at CERN for providing us with access to the wonderful Wire Chamber Studios here at CERN and all the help that comes with it. The opinions expressed here are our own and do not necessarily reflect those of CERN 
or our colleagues, even though we think they ought to. Uh, my name is Stephen Goldfarb. This has been Early Morning Coffee at CERN, and we'll see you again next month.